who got um, fumbled by Rolf Harris when he was here years and years ago. I remember when he came here. Yeah, and that, you know, apparently this was absolutely chronic and nobody said anything. Let's hope that, you know, it's now out in the open. People will complain. As a woman who has been round for quite a few decades, I will say none of this surprises me. Is that right? None of it. And, in fact, what you're seeing here is a change in culture uh, where it has become unacceptable now for this sort of behaviour to take place. But let me assure you, it has been acceptable for a long, long time. Yes, centuries. That's right, and decades. We want to talk about Garrison Keeler if we've got time. His successor on Prairie Home Companion, now called Town Hall, says uh, this is his successor. Today we are in the middle of a national movement which I believe represents progress. We're recognising the harmful power imbalance that women have had to endure for so long in our culture. Uh, With awareness will come improvement. Now, uh, Milo Yiannopoulos, the um, libertarian enfant terrible mm-hmm. in now touring Australia, says the opposite will happen. Women won't get hired for certain jobs. Facebook's Cheryl Sandberg uh, kind of agrees with him. She says, I've already heard the rumblings of a backlash. This is why you shouldn't hire women. That's what I've heard, she says. So, what do you think will happen? A new age of transparency or not so much? I think we will get there, but I think there will be short-term effects that have been described, and I think the people who will suffer the most will be attractive young women. If you are somebody who is regarded as pretty plain and unlikely to have anyone make a pass at you, you're probably safer to employ. That's a very I mean, s- it's a very cynical view, but that's the sort of reality of what is out there. A columnist in the New York Daily News says it's time women ran things. When was the last time you heard sexual harassment charges against women in power? High school (laughs) teachers exempted. Does it go with the power or does it go with the testosterone? Is it the power? Power power is, is totally an aphrodisiac. There is no doubt about it. And... I think it works both ways in terms of gender. Uh, There are powerful women who some men uh, are keen uh, to um, uh, have a relationship with um, often so they can talk about it. Right. So are you saying that even if it is time women ran things and they end up running things, the same problem would still be in existence? I think as long as You're libido... You're they're going to behave like blokes. No, I'm saying that as long as libido exists, there will be these issues. But I wouldn't say that if women... If we suddenly overnight had women running everything, I still think that there would be accusations like this out there because that's the nature of the human condition. The nature of the beast. The most serious offender is the president of the United States, and he's got away with it. There's your message. Mike Williams has been on the panel today with... Thank you, Mike. Always pleasure. nice to see you with Michelle Berg. Thank you, Michelle. A pleasure. We are back uh, tomorrow with the panel. Thank you very much for your company, and shortly, John Campbell and Checkpoint. everyone. Tonight on Checkpoint, we're in Napier, where residents are angry, confused, you name it, about why they got so little warning about the town's water crisis. Even the local MP, Stuart Nash, seems not to have known what was going on. The Auckland Council has voted in favour of Arahui and the Waitakere Rangers to curb the spread of Cody dieback. 80,000 tertiary students will reap the benefits of the government's zero fees policy next year, year one, where inside the Mangari Refugee Centre is 164 refugees prepare for their new lives. The Supreme Court lets Donald Trump's travel ban take effect in excitement in Dunedin over plans to reopen the hillside train workshops. And it's Christmas early in Otara.
RNZ News at 5. Good afternoon, I'm Anna Thomas. The Auckland Council has decided against closing the Waitakere Ranges as a way of stopping the spread of kauri dieback. Councillors voted this afternoon in favour of keeping the regional park open but closing medium to high risk tracks. The Mayor, Phil Goff, told the meeting that while he sympathises with calls for total closure, uh, policing that would be near impossible. There is no way that we can simply close the park and ensure that nobody goes into it. Uh, unless you were to put an electric fence or a, or a razor wire fence around the park, which is absolutely impossible, uh, you won't be able to stop people who want to go into the park doing so. Phil Goff says the council supports the Rahui declared on Sunday and will be asking people to respect it. The Ombudsman has released a scathing report into Christchurch Men's Prison, one of the country's biggest. During an inspection, 67% of prisoners who filled out a survey said they feel unsafe and 49% said they'd been assaulted. The Ombudsman says conditions for at-risk prisoners are unacceptable and there's no suitable accommodation for people suffering from mental illness or who may be contemplating suicide. He says high-risk prisoners are also spending too much time locked up and lack access to meaningful activities when unlocked. Several recommendations have been made to address the problems. The Department of Conservation has asked the police to investigate a threatening letter from a group calling itself New Zealand Hunters. The anonymous writer says the group will bring down helicopters unless Doc stops using 1080 pest control. The Director General of Conservation, Lou Sanson, says threats to Doc staff are taken very seriously and will not be tolerated. An anonymous letter in October said Sika deer were being released in Taranaki forests in retaliation for 1080 operations. Doc has culled 17 of those deer so far, from an estimated 30 released. The latest letter threatens the release of more deer. The Prime Minister says that most of the 80,000 tertiary students who will pay no fees next year will be enrolled in polytechnics and private institutions. Jacinda Ardern today announced the policy under which the government will pay fees of up to $12,000 for tertiary study. Our education correspondent John Gerritsen reports. From January the 1st, the government will pay one year of tertiary fees or two years of course costs for apprentices. Only school leavers and people who have completed less than half a year of full-time study are eligible. The government says the zero-fee policy combined with increases to student support will cost $380 million this financial year. The National Party says the government will end up paying for enrolments in low-value courses and the policy will lead to higher dropout rates. Call John Gerritsen in TNA. Some of the country's biggest law firms and their clients have signed up to a new policy aimed at getting female lawyers more high-profile cases and positions. Although nearly half of all lawyers are female, less than a third of directors or partners are women. Under the new policy, law firms and their clients will look to have female lawyers take the lead on at least 30% of major cases. Progress will have to be reported to the Law Society, which will measure the policy's effectiveness. The Society's president, Catherine Beck, says having corporate clients like Spark and Fonterra sign up puts pressure on other firms to walk the talk. These clients are saying, we want things to change and we expect you guys to help us change it. And when clients send that message, good lawyers will listen. Catherine Beck of the Law Society. Napier residents fuming over an unforeseen water shortage are certain there's more to the story than they're being told. Reservoir levels dropped after water use soared on Sunday night and the City Council suddenly urged residents to conserve water and stop watering their gardens or cleaning their cars. Locals say they were only told about the problem at the 11th hour and should have been warned in advance. Many spoken to by RNZ News are convinced the council's explanation does not stack up and they're angry at being kept in the dark for so long. The father of an Aussie ruled star deported to New Zealand has had a crucial win in his fight to get back into Australia. In the federal court today, a lawyer for Immigration Minister Peter Dutton dropped the case against Shane Martin, the father of AFL player Dustin Martin. Mr Martin was deported early last year because of his links to the Rebels motorcycle gang, but his lawyer says it seems a legal mistake was made. 
The case comes back to court on December the 19th and the lawyer says Mr Martin could be back with his family before Christmas. However, in several previous cases where the federal court has overturned visa cancellations, the minister has stepped straight back in to cancel them again. It's five past five. Two Sport and the Black Caps are hoping the return of Tim Southey for the second test against the West Indies in Hamilton will help secure a series sweep. The pace bowler missed the first test win because of the birth of his child. Now he's averaging just over seven wickets in his last three tests in Hamilton and coach Mike Hesson is looking forward to his return. They've had their baby, I mean, you know, it's all, all gone well. Um, and Tim's obviously played yesterday uh, or a couple of days ago for ND. Um, he's feeling good and obviously, you know, he's a really nice record for us in Hamilton as well. So um, good to have him back. Mike Hesson and the test starts on Saturday. Meanwhile, in the second Ashes test in Adelaide, Australia have slipped to 75 for six early on day four, a lead of 290. Athletics New Zealand is hoping to attract some of the world's top athletes here in March with the announcement of five meetings around the country ahead of the Gold Coast Commonwealth Games. World champion Tom Walsh will host two shot put events in his hometowns of Timaru and Christchurch. And Olympic bronze medalist Eliza McCartney will star in a pole vault event in Auckland and there will also be four meetings in Whanganui and West Auckland. And the New Zealand squash player Paul Cole has risen to a career-high world ranking of eight. Joelle King remains the best-placed New Zealand woman at ninth. And that's the news. Fire in Ashburton. It's a big fire. Um, obviously, the shed is totaled now. We've um, scaled down firefighting efforts over the night. Napier runs out of water. We will have to go to water restrictions and, and peak period. It's probably quite typical across the country to implement some sort of restrictions. Post office closes its doors in Auckland. As the days pass, I feel as if I'm being uh, issued a death sentence. My heart starts squeezing every day. Morning Report with Guy and Espiner and Kim Hill, weekdays from 6. Then on 9 to noon, a disabilities education expert says trainee teachers are woefully underprepared to offer true inclusive education. And after 10, we meet the modern day James Herriot, star of the TV show The Yorkshire Vet, Julian Norton. Join me, Lynn Freeman, in for Catherine Ryan after Morning Report on RNZ National. And now looking at the Met Service forecast until midnight tomorrow. Northland, Auckland and Coromandel Peninsula mainly fine. Isolated showers about the coast north of Whangarei tomorrow. Waikato to Kapiti, including a bay of plenty, Taupo, Taumaranui and Taihape. Fine apart from isolated afternoon and evening showers inland from Whanganui and Taihape northwards. Gisborne and Hawke's Bay mostly fine, however cloud increasing later tomorrow with isolated light evening showers. Wellington and Wired Up are fine but becoming cloudy overnight, then clearing towards midday tomorrow. Nelson, Buller and Marlborough fine apart from isolated showers inland and areas of cloud about the Kaikoura coast. For the rest of the South Island fine but cloudy periods developing and there could be some inland showers too. Chatham Islands cloudy with a few showers tomorrow morning. RNZ National, it's 8 past 5 and you're listening to Checkpoint with John Campbell. And Anna Thomas reading the news. Thank you very much indeed, Anna Thomas. Anna Thomas is just giving me a hard time because I've just realised for the first time today that I'm wearing a completely different jacket from trousers. Two suits on. Two suits on simultaneously. But very smart still. Yeah, they're both blue. <laughs> All my suits are blue, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, <laughs> Pip's saying I look like a policeman. Um, anyway, thank you for being with us. A bit of a different old checkpoint tonight. We've got the stories of the day, but we've got a couple of uh, lovely packages as well. We're inside the Mangere Refugee Centre where 164 people are becoming New Zealanders and an early Christmas in Otara, which is a very moving story. That's coming up. But let's begin with 80,000 tertiary students who will pay no fees next year after the Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern announced the details of the government's zero fees policy today. Ms Ardern says the government will pay fees of up to $12,000 each each for school leavers and people who've done no more than half a year of full-time tertiary education. Our education correspondent John Gerritsen was at Poriro's Arte College for the launch today. Here today we are officially launching your first year of study will be absolutely free. Absolutely free. And we're kicking that off here. Jacinda Ardern and Labour's flagship education policy got a warm welcome at Aotea College and later the Prime Minister talked to students about their plans for the future. Before this policy, 
see, was it going to be loans as well? Oh, definitely. Yeah. There was no yeah. question about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not just for the study side of things, but accommodation and everything. Yeah. 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 But having free study just makes it so much easier. Yeah. 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 Ms Ardern says 80,000 students are expected to take up the zero fee option next year and was at pains to emphasise that most of them wouldn't be bound for university. The majority of students who take this up are likely to go into polytech, vocational training, apprenticeships, wānanga and PTEs, um, not university. And so we want to really emphasise those are the areas where we need more skills and trade training and those are the areas where we're likely to see uptake. The government estimates about 2,000 or 3% of the students will be people who would not otherwise have studied. Aotea College student Elena Tolai says she might be one of them. I wasn't planning on going to you know, university next year because financially speaking, but now that this you know, policy is now in place, it brings an option to the table now and I'm thinking of going into it now and yeah, so that's pretty awesome. The school's head girl, Joanna Pulipuli, says she was going to university next year anyway, but the policy will have a big impact on Pacifica families. As a Pacific Islander, it's definitely brought off barriers financially. I'm the eldest of eight, so yeah. <laughs> so definitely for my parents, it just opens new pathways to be able to financially support my younger siblings as well. So I think this policy is great. Nooroa Faraimo is going to Otago University next year and she says she'll now try to persuade some of her relatives that they should think about tertiary education too. It's a game changer for a lot of doors to be open for a lot of students and other people who have never thought about studying before. I am pretty excited to like, exercise some thoughts into some relatives who I feel like uh, should go back and study or follow their passions and um, different opportunities that they can now have because of this. But Nationals Tertiary Education spokesperson Paul Goldsmith says taxpayers will end up paying for more people to study low-value courses and the policy opens the door for a lot of wasteful spending. It's a bit like you know, the old sort of regime when you'd buy a CD and you'd get 15 songs that you didn't want in order to buy the one song that you did want. Instead of trying to get the, the students that they really want in tertiary education who wouldn't have gone otherwise, they're paying for everybody. And that is just an incredibly expensive and untargeted way to go about government spending. The government's budgeted up to $380 million in the current year for the zero fee policy and the $50 a week boost to student loans and allowances. Prospective students can find more information on the policy at the website feesfree.govt.nz. Moti hotaka, moti ahi ahi, ko John Gerrits and Tene. Let's head to Napier now, where some, lo uh, some locals are pretty furious. They were left in the dark over the town's water crisis, which left reservoirs so low yesterday, it was feared they could potentially run dry. Water usage dropped significantly overnight after the council asked people to just tie a hoe. But hot, dry days are expected for at least another week, and locals say they really should have been better forewarned. Charlie Drever reports from Napier. It's 26 degrees and the sun is beating down in the coastal city of Napier. But while many residents are out basking in the sun and sipping their coffees, as resident Brian Quirk points out, there's fear about what this could mean for precious water supplies. Well, it's a bit of a worry. I mean, it looks like this weather's going to continue quite a few more days. So interesting. I mean, we get this weather all the time. It doesn't bode well for the rest of the summer because it looks like it's going to be really hot. Many residents are angry. They were only told about the situation yesterday. My thoughts are why weren't we told beforehand and I think the Mayor is responsible and should have let us know about it. Mm, yeah, I'm not so happy I've been kept in the dark. But to me it, it, it seems that they haven't got the pump capacity to fill the reservoirs. I just think it's gobsmacking, it's berserk and I think there's a lot more to it than what we've been told. However, Napier City Council Infrastructure Director John Kingsford says the drop in reservoir levels was only a recent development. I can tell you now that as of Sunday morning, the levels in our reservoirs were relatively normal. So the great drawdown in reservoir levels occurred from Sunday morning through to Monday morning. Where we would normally see a recharge happening overnight, the unique situation that we did face is that that did not occur. John Kingsford says this was due to a mix of warmer than average weather over the weekend and significantly low rainfall last month. The council has banned watering of gardens and other non-essential water use, which is set to slowly ease over the next few days. But many residents were not aware until it was too late. 
I must admit I got caught this morning. I watered the garden because I wasn't even aware there was a ban. I was out last night and then I picked my paper up and went, oops. I found out through the news last night. Yeah, it was like, that was the only way. Yeah, it's crap. This included local MP Stuart Nash. I was watering my camellias on Sunday and I had no idea we had this crisis and I read about it in the paper. So I think the Napier City Council might have to have a look at their overall comms plan. But Mayor Bill Dalton says residents have been kept well informed. The proof of the pudding is in the eating and if you saw the response and how the reservoirs actually built up last night, it proves that the message did get out there and it worked and it proved people of Napier knew exactly what to do and they reacted positively. He says Napier residents use well above the national average of water and something needs to be done. He wouldn't rule out eventually introducing water metres. In the meantime, a water conservation campaign has started, offering residents tips on how they can lower their water usage. The recent scare has left many residents panic buying water. My daughter went last night before this even happened and she said there was people were crowding around water then so Did you have to go to the supermarkets at all to get water? I sure been... did, yeah. You know, and I'm a beneficiary, so that was just something that came out of my kids you know, that came out of Christmas and, and groceries for the week, so it sucks. Food staff says they've been receiving extra shipments of water just in case, but the council is confident if water use continues to be used sparingly, this won't be necessary. Although for many residents, the sunny weather forecast until next week will be met with apprehension. For Checkpoint, I'm Charlie Drever. <laughs> You are with Checkpoint on RNZ. Coming up on the programme, we're inside the Mangavi Refugee Centre as 164 refugees prepare for their new lives as New Zealanders. Excitement, pla uh, excitement builds in Dunedin over plans to reopen the hillside train workshops to build luxury rail carriages. This is really good news in Dunedin. We would love your feedback, especially if you live in Napier or you're planning to take up the free tertiary fees next year or have a child who is do Texas 2101. You can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ. We are, of course, on Facebook and our email is checkpoint at radionz.co.nz. You may have feedback on this next story too. Environmentalists, and they're not alone, are disappointed at the Auckland Council's decision not to completely close the Waitakere Ranges in a bid to stop the spread of Cody dieback. Council has voted this afternoon in favour of keeping the regional park open but closing 13 medium to high risk tracks. 13. There are 172 tracks in the city's second largest regional park. Councillor Penny Hulse is the chair of the council's environment uh, and community committee and also the Waitakere Ward. Councillor Penny, are you there? I am, John, yes. Th thanks for joining us. Which way did you vote? We, I voted for the recommendations. The mayor and I put forward the recommendations that were passed. OK, so that is the 13 tracks closed but not the Waitakere Ranges themselves. So remember these are new track closures that we're proposing. There's already a lot of tracks that are already closed in the Waitakere Ranges. So, so how many, excluding the 13, are now open in total? Um, gosh, we've got hundreds of tracks in the ranges. Sorry, About, I haven't my, got my, the, So the my sense, breakdown. once you've closed these 13, yeah. there will be 172 yeah. 72 still open, right? No, no, we've already closed. Sorry, I'm just I'm actually still sitting in the council chambers um, with all my pages in front of me. I'll just I can double check the number of of um, texts that absolutely. We've already got you, you, you you do that. Look, yep. that'd be fantastic, yep. and, and we'll keep we'll keep you there while you do that. I'll I'll talk about the people who have asked for a more complete and absolute closure. Arahui, for example, Te Kawaro Amaki. Uh, the Tangata Whenua, of course, they are asking for a complete closure. Judith Collins uh, has called the council wimps for not doing a complete closure. Forest and Bird saying complete closure. Scientists, uh, including people who really know the Cody tree, are saying this is a magnificent, unique tree and it is now threatened. And they have all asked you to do more than this. Are you back with those figures, Benny Hulse? 
Yeah, we're just having a look. So in the in the report, we've got the temporary closures. That uh, that's the 13 track closures. We've got 11 that are going from temporary to permanent, and then we've got some tracks that are already closed. Why don't you do more? Why don't you just say, look, we're tremendously sorry, everyone, but the greater good has to be served. These trees have to be given a shot at being saved. Oh, John, that's why the, the meeting was so long. We've debated this for five hours, and I think in everybody's hearts, ideally, it would be fantastic to say to Aucklanders, you know, let's just leave the forest be and um, abide by the Rahui. Practicality of closing the ranges is huge, and the legal advice we have is, you know, you, you cannot simply um, keep people out of the ranges without some fairly grunty legislation behind us. Also, given the fact that it's not just the park, it's Titarangi, it's Swanson, it's our, you know, the roads to the beaches. So where we've settled is saying we're going to crack on and and close our our um, medium and high risk tracks we're going to carry on with the the track building in the areas where there is no danger to to Kauri and or where there is no Kauri and we're also going to really ramp up our our our, our plea, I guess, to, to Auckland is to say, think twice before coming to the ranges. What about walking at Te Arai or on Pākari Beach or Tawharanui or down south? But give the ranges a break. Does the council acknowledge the Cody are endangered? Oh, God, of course we do. You know, okay. we've been working on this for... Absolutely. So the, um, you know, so, so the, so the this science is good. Over so, 600,000. Okay. okay. But, you so, know, this so, is, so is this... We've been taking terribly seriously. Okay, so so the science is good. You agree with it. You take it seriously. These uh, unique and precious trees are endangered. The question is, why aren't you doing more? Is it a failure of nerve or you just don't think? I mean, I'm really interested in your legal advice. Who was that from? Mm. It's from the council legal team. Okay, and the and council the legal union... team, are they telling you it's not enforceable? They are. And, the you know, let, let's just take a step back. So kauri, we have kauri dieback in the North Island. We have kauri in dock areas and we have it in um, areas that are managed um, by council. And the, the approach has been to manage the tracks, to close tracks where there's um, high contamination and also to fund the science. And that's what we've, we've been doing, the experimentation with phosphite injections and also looking for trees that are resistant and breeding from those trees. We've been acknowledged um, around the country for our innovation and the report that we produced. We were the first to measure kauri dieback over the last few years because no one else is doing it or taking it as seriously as we are. And DOC is now using the the type of um, foot cleaning areas that, that we've designed. So we've been working hard out for six years on this. Could we have done more? Of course we could have. But the Rahui and the raising of this issue by Te Kaurau Amaki has added a real extra energy to this. So that's why we're ramping up our budget. We're ramping up the track closures, but we're doing what's practical. Penny Hulse, Waitakere Councillor, thank you so much for joining us live with uh, well, reaction to that vote that took place at about four o'clock. A Papakura woman whose jaw was broken during a violent dairy robbery last Monday is still unable to eat and having to drink through a straw because her surgery has been postponed twice. Three men stormed the Opaheke dairy in Papakura on Monday night, repeatedly punching Sarika Patel in the face, breaking her jaw, leaving her mother with a black eye and her father with stitches. The Crime Prevention Group told Zach Fleming a short time ago the family is distraught at surgery delays. These guys, they, they came and they, they physically smashed them uh, on the face and wherever they could hit. Uh, and there was uh, this gentleman, uh, Patel, and his wife. So even these offenders, they did not show any respect to the females as well. So this lady was also brutally uh, attacked. So she has a uh, hugely swollen eyes and on the nose and the same as with the man. But the biggest one is when the daughter uh, came from inside. So they attacked the daughter and uh, her jaw is very badly broken. So she requires uh, a surgery. And did, uh, did they have weapons, or, or was it just their bare fists, or, or, or what was no, it? No, the 
uh, I think this was uh, done by the FIS, uh, and then these were quite uh, large and very strong guys. Um, what, they what did they end up stealing? Uh, they did not uh, steal. Uh, uh, probably, uh, you know, there, there were a lot of noise uh, uh, and cries at the time. So I think, uh, and there could be somebody coming from outside as well. So they they, they ran away. So they, they take. sorry. So they got into this dairy uh, and yeah. beat up the owner and his daughter, and then left yeah. without stealing yeah. anything. That's correct. So she needed uh, uh, urgent surgery. You know, it's nearly a week's time now. Uh, it, it has been um, uh, refused twice uh, uh, from the Middlemore Hospital. Now this poor girl, obviously, she is so much traumatized. And also she's gone through that kind of ordeal and she's unable to uh, eat anything. And uh, uh, having refused surgery two times uh, is uh, really um, affecting her health badly. What are the reasons that Middlemore Hospital is giving for the refusals? Uh, I guess that there could be a rush uh, and there could be... um, uh, you know, more um, serious cases coming in, uh, and probably they're not able to cop up with the kind of demand uh, at the state. But that that shouldn't be the uh, excuse. Uh, you know, uh, when we look at the victims of such crime, um, of course, you know they they are the one who uh, require more attention. We need to give importance to to victims' rights. And so her her surgery is being postponed. Does she have a, a new date for when that might be? Uh, not uh, as of today, she doesn't have any new date, and uh, the parents uh, and the family is very, very concerned, looking at the condition of the girl. Yeah, is she? Uh, you said she can't eat. Is she having to dr- drink through a straw at the moment? Or? Yeah, yeah, because you know, I mean, if it's, the jaw is so badly broken because the injury is inside, uh, um, so she's she's not able to eat anything. Sunny Koshal talking to Azak Fleming. Sunny's from the Crime Prevention. Group. It's December 5th and this coming up is our first Christmas story. With 20 days to go, many of our children await Christmas with a great sense of excitement. Let us to Santa request to mum and dad new bikes or scooters or screens or something. Many but not all. Child poverty doesn't take Christmas off. Low income families who struggle to pay the bills during the year don't suddenly get a windfall at Christmas time. There are children for whom Christmas is a day off, yes, and a day with family, yes, but not a day of unwrapping presents. Johanna the Momo knows them. Teachers in parts of Auckland know them, parents know them, of course. So local volunteers supported by businesses who released staff or made donations have collected presents for children in Ōtara. Nothing flash, no Xboxes, but a gift to open and to have. And this morning our cameraman Nick Munro and I went to one of the schools in Ōtara where presents were being given out. If you're listening, Santa is David Tua. And one by one, the students of St. John the Evangelist School are coming to collect presents from him. Merry Christmas! Every child a present. Because every child loves Christmas, not just the kids with mums and dads who can afford it. It's awesome seeing the faces of the kids, isn't it? I think I saw you wiping a bit of a tear before. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's very emotional, you know. Merry we've, Christmas. we've worked really hard um, over the last six months. Merry Christmas. <laughs> it's very You're emotional. Welcome. And just to see the joy Merry on their Christmas. faces and um, the situations that they're in Christmas. during Christmas and the hard times that they go through and to thank us, it just makes it all worthwhile. You know? This lovely production line, Small Acts of Kindness, A Child at a Time, was the brainchild of Johanna Damomo. And what she knew is that some kids don't get presents. And what she decided was to do something about it. That's all we did. There were disbelievers out there that didn't believe that we could do this, but we just kept doing it for the tamariki, and we did it. How many kids are you giving presents to? 4,000. Well, that's in schools and daycares. Then there's 500 for the Otara um, uh, kitchen, uh, soup kitchen, and then there's another 500. And then there's also homeschool kids that will drip feed as well. So we did 6,000 all up. (laughs) Yep. Merry Christmas. (laughs) It's volunteer work, school by school. This morning they're led in by Santa, who once went the distance with Lennox Lewis, but is here fighting something bigger and tougher to beat, child poverty. You know, a lot of our kids, uh, 
you know, uh, during Christmas time, uh, we'll go without a present. So really, it's, it's got nothing to do with the gifts. You know, I think it's just letting them know that they are being acknowledged, that they are worth, you know. Uh, so I think uh, for me to be part of this is actually, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very emotional. So uh, it's a beautiful thing to be part of. Violence is not the point here. Disadvantage is. I spoke to children this morning who don't get Christmas presents, who've never been to the movies, who've never left Auckland. Rent is responsible for that. Minimum wage jobs, market rents. There's just nothing left when the bills have been paid each week. What were Christmases like for you when you were little? It was sometimes rough. Um, Sometimes barren, you know, we wouldn't get presents and we were, we were struggling. What's your name? Faustina Faimasasa. And what do you want to be when you grow up? A news reporter. I, I really encourage you to be a news reporter. Yes. You've got a sparkle in your eyes, I reckon you'd be fantastic at it. <laughs> Faustina is a delight, bright, engaged, optimistic, a child to be proud of, clearly beautifully raised. Um, what's Christmas mean for you? A um, uh, time to spend with your family and to like get to know each other instead of like being busy with work, not like having time to speak with family. Yeah. Just stopping and being together. Yes. yes. What present did you get? Have you looked? No. Did you have a look? Oh, your friends. <laughs> That's pretty cool. What's your favourite music? Oh, um, pretty much his music. Yeah, I like just about everything. <laughs> yes. How's the school? Um, very good. Um, I hope to leave with, like, people remembering me with, like, a good, like, I was a good person, not, like, someone bad. I'm going to remember you were a good person. I'm, I know that already. <laughs> Thank you. And how's money at home for things, presents and stuff like that? Have you got enough for...? No. Only last year we um, did um, Secret Santa and like, we got the chance to, like, the first time to get presents. How old are you? I'm 12. And it was your first time to get presents? <laughs> yes. Do you think people understand that there will be kids in this room who aren't getting terribly much at all? I, I think it, only the people that know, only the people that have experienced themselves. There's a lot of kids in New Zealand that, that goes without a present. So uh, this initiative here, uh, actually, it's a, it's a beautiful awareness that allows our community to know that, you know, it's about us coming together, you know, um, to let our kids know that they are worth and let them know that, uh, you know, something is better than nothing. So let them know that they are, are not forgotten. That's why I thank these people for their goodness and their um, caring hand. So lovely to meet you. I can't wait till you become a news reporter. I'll watch all your reports. <laughs> thank you. Faustina's sense of possibility, her ambition, was what Johanna Kamomo had in mind when she came up with this idea. A reminder that they matter, these kids, that material deprivation should not axiomatically mean exclusion, that someone is watching and wishing them well, that their dreams deserve the same chance of fulfilment as those of any other child in this country. Hello. Hi. What's your name? Junior. Junior? Yes. Nice to meet you, Junior. Nice to meet you too. Nice what, to meet you too. What do you want to be when you grow up? A police officer. Do you? Yes. Junior, the would-be cop, Faustina, the would-be news reporter, one by one they and all the other children collected their Christmas presents and wandered out into their future. It was a lovely morning, a privilege to meet those children and to watch kindness and the impact it has. You can really see that this is valuable to them, you know, and it's, it's worthwhile. And we're going to do it again. We're going to do it next year. Welcome. Definitely. Some of their faces. Some of their faces. <laughs> Priceless. Absolutely priceless. Merry Christmas. Ah, oh, beautiful. Merry Christmas.
26 minutes to 6 coming up long time. Waiheke Island residents say they're being booted out of their rental accommodation because holidaymakers pay more. The Supreme Court in America lets Donald Trump's travel ban take effect. Nona has business news, but all of that will follow. Anna Thomas with the headlines. Thanks, John. The Ombudsman has released a scathing report into Christchurch Men's Prison, one of the country's biggest. During an inspection, 67% of prisoners who filled out a survey said they feel unsafe, and 49% said they'd been assaulted. The Ombudsman says conditions for at-risk prisoners are unacceptable and there's no suitable accommodation for people suffering from mental illness or who may be contemplating suicide. The Prime Minister says most of the 80,000 tertiary students who will pay no fees next year will be enrolled in polytechnics and private institutions. Jacinda Ardern today announced the policy under which the government will pay fees of up to $12,000 for tertiary study. Only school leavers and people who have completed less than half a year of full-time study are eligible. The Auckland Council has decided against closing the Waitakere Ranges as a way of stopping the spread of kauri dieback. Councillors voted this afternoon in favour of keeping the regional park open but closing medium to high risk tracks. The Deputy Mayor Penny Hulse told Checkpoint more tracks would go from temporary to permanent closure. The Mayor Phil Goff says while he sympathises with calls for total closure, policing that would be near impossible. The Napier City Council says it won't rule out the introduction of water meters following the reservoir scare. Uh, they were at critical levels yesterday and water restrictions have been put into place. The Department of Conservation has asked the police to investigate a threatening letter from a group calling itself New Zealand Hunters. The anonymous writer says the group will bring down helicopters unless DOC stops using 1080 pest control. Some of the country's biggest law firms and their clients have signed up to a new policy aimed at getting women lawyers more high-profile cases and positions. Although nearly half of all lawyers are female, they comprise less than a third of directors or partners. And that's the news. Thanks, Anna. Let's turn to business news now with Nona Peltier. Hi, Nona. Hello. Uh, the country's largest private transport and logistics business, Transport Investments, is going to list on the stock exchange. When? Yes, well, they're going to list on Thursday. Right. They're doing a backdoor listing. They got a company called Bethunes. Those shareholders approved the deal, which values the company, which is going to be known as uh, Transport, no, TIL Logistics Group. So from Transport Investments, which owns a number of brands which might some people be familiar with, Hooker Pacific, TNL, Roadstar, and NZL. Yep. They're going to be known as the TIL Logistics Group. They're, uh, the, so the deal values the company at $200 million, and they're hoping to grow with that. And uh, the reason they're listing is to give more liquidity to their shareholders and to give the uh, fellows who run the company a way to retire one day. Yeah, <laughs> nicely put, Lana. <laughs> no, no. Talking of liquidity, oh, bad segue. Why make a delegate? <laughs> Held its AGM in Auckland today, right? Oh, well, I didn't have any wine, I did, can tell you. Well, so they don't tell me they serve cups of tea. They did have they some wine out They actually do have some good, wine, but good. I had to rush back to the office yeah. so I could produce all this wonderful stuff Thank for you, you guys. Know. Anyways, yeah, they, um, they wanted to let the market know that they've up uh, graded their full year profit, underlying profit forecast. Uh, things are going really well. They've been helped by the low New Zealand dollar. So they moved their um, underlying profit increase to 40.7% a million for the year ending in June from 38.5 and that New Zealand dollar is a little lower but nice not today today yeah. it's gained a little bit of ground after the Reserve Bank uh, deputy um, acting governor had some words to say he didn't really say anything of interest particularly but the market seemed to like that strengthened a little bit 69.1 US cents 90.3 Australian 51.3 pence and our top 50 index was slightly weaker. It was down nine points to 8,176. Nona Peltier, thank you very much indeed. It's beaches, blue waters, vineyards, luxury homes and proximity to a large city have made it a globally famous destination. But on Waiheke Island, a 35-minute ferry ride into the Hauraki Gulf from downtown Auckland, some locals have paid a very high price for their island having been discovered by the world. With rents rising, many long-time residents are being booted out of their rentals to make way for holidaymakers who'll pay more. Reporter Eva Corlett spoke to some islanders who now rely on a soup kitchen. Mitty was 60 years old when she moved to the island to retire two years ago. 
She says her first landlord, who lived in the flat above her, threw her out during a drunken rage and gave her 24 hours to pack. With nowhere to go and little money, she pleaded with neighbours to take her in. To be honest with you, sometimes I really just want to kill myself. Then I thought, no, at this time my mum's still alive. And I said, no, I just see my mum's face. And I thought, no, I have to stand on my own two feet and, and go forward, look forward and move forward. I don't have to do this, because if I do this, my mum will be upset, my family will be upset, they won't see me, I won't see them. And I said, no, I have to be strong. Eventually, the Living Waters Church in Surfdale rented Mary a cabin on their grounds. Flower pots dot the front of her new home and the single room is stacked to the ceiling with her belongings. It's small and, on a hot day, stifling. She pays $200 a week to live there, which includes bills and shared facilities. But Mary is grateful to be there. They always tell me, oh, Mary, thank you for helping you. What are we going to do without you? Because they know, you know, I help them a lot too. They help me, I help them too. Yes, we look after each other. Another soup kitchen regular, Daniel, has found a place to live on a small yacht. But it's been a patchy 12-year ride getting there. I have struggled over the, t over the period of time. Um, I uh, struggled with paying it, or, you know, weekly and having to uh, basically end up living on the beaches and stuff like that. With limited emergency housing on the island, four years ago the church's pastor, Wirimu Te Tanifa, started emergency accommodation and the soup kitchen, which feeds 50 people a week. A lot of people are struggling here on Waiheke. A lot of the locals are struggling. The cost of living is quite high. Uh, when it comes to accommodation, extremely difficult to find a place. In particular, when there's a um, when it comes to this type of season, a, a lot of people are on just uh, uh, what do you call it, um, short-term lease agreements. So come December, January, through to February, it's very, very difficult to find a place to stay. The church can only house up to eight people at any one time. Some stay a few days, others years. But Mr. Titanifa says he often has to turn people away. Many have a troubling tale, derelict rentals and eye-watering rent. Some were being priced out of their homes, others were booted out to make way for summer's tourists. Mr Titanifa says that the community needs to step up. There is homes on the island that have been vacant for months and months and months and, and if, if people can reach out and say, hey, I can do something. You know, we, we saw a need and we says, man, we've, we've got a little bit of land, we got some, let's get some units, we can do something. And if other people on the island says, hey, I've got a little bit of land, maybe I can do something, um, it'll help. The director of the new Waiheke Community Housing Trust, Paul Carew, says supply isn't an issue, but affordability is. A two-bedroom place can cost upwards of $600 per week in rent, and that can become $600 a night over summer. The Trust has bought a plot of land to build three affordable rentals, but Mr Carew says the banks have draconian funding rules. Well, we've been to the banks and several of them have said yes and then looked into it and the uh, repayment terms come down from 25 to 15 years. They're calculating it at 8% interest, they want a 25% buffer and they'll only consider 80% of the um, rental that's, that's available and you put all those things together and sorry you don't qualify. He says the trust can't build until the banks become less risk averse. Local board member and third generation islander Paul Walden says the desirability of Waiheke life is driving up house and rent prices. It's very difficult for people to actually you know grow up and live through this community and you know and maintain it as somewhere they can live. Um, unless, of course, they happen to have, um, you know, some freehold land, um, you know, or the ability to make a truckload of money um, on the way through. And so, in a sense, what we see is a little bit of a revolving door um, of a population which isn't particularly desirable. He says a visitor tax to the island or a transaction tax on real estate sales would help the community to become self-sustainable. I waiheke mō te hōtaka o te ahiahi ko iwa ko let, tēnei. The Prime Minister's offer to take 150 Manus Island refugees was almost accepted yesterday after a farcical day in Australia's Parliament that saw a vote in favour of the offer, then a vote rejecting it. Australia closed down the Manus Island Detention Centre at the end of October and has refused to accept New Zealand's offer on the basis the refugees would use the opportunity as a backdoor move to Australia. 
But if the offer is accepted in the future, where would they end up when they arrive? Well, in the first instance, it's the Mangari Refugee Centre. And Zach Fleming and cameraman Nick Munro visited as the latest intake of 164 men, women and children prepare to move on. It's just before 2pm. PE is nearly over. A group of teenage boys is playing basketball. Half court, so two teams, but one hoop. They're competitive and loud. And they don't care that they're not very good. We filmed the last two and a half minutes of their game. Not one hoop was sunk, but they were still all goofy white grins at the end. Good game. The boys are from Colombia, Syria and Myanmar. They only met a few weeks ago and they have almost nothing in common. Except none of them will ever go back to where they were born. They are now and will forever be refugees. They're just happy to be here. They are different from migrants. They are people who have been uprooted from their homes. There's this not something that they've chosen or planned. Chamal Marathi's mother came to New Zealand as a refugee from Kosovo. As Immigration New Zealand's refugee quota branch manager, he's made helping people like her his job. Today, though, he's showing us around the Māngari Refugee Resettlement Centre, which reopened in June last year after a $25 million rebuild. Every refugee that comes to New Zealand spends six weeks here. There are up to six intakes of around 170 people each year, and they're taken here straight off the plane. They're offered medical help, both physical and mental, given the horrors most have endured to get here, and basically then start to learn about their new country. There are security cameras and the gates are locked, but that's to keep people out, not in. Everyone has their own keycard, they can leave whenever they want, and can even stay elsewhere overnight if they give notice. The first place Jamal takes us is the first place refugees come to, a big bare wooden floored room reminiscent of a school hall. There's a porphyry and the refugees are invited to speak. Now some of people will have the opportunity to talk about their past experiences for the first time openly and freely without concerns of, you know, mm. of, from the places where they fled from yeah. and, and it, it, it's, it's quite, quite, quite a special, special day. The group of 164 currently here came from Afghanistan, Bhutan, China, Colombia, Ecuador, Ethiopia, Iran, Myanmar, Pakistan, Palestine, Somalia, Sudan and Syria. Now they have to learn to be New Zealanders, so they go to school. All of them, from preschool aged kids to... The oldest is 72 or something, oh. yeah, all the way through. Maria Hayward is the director of the Education Centre here. She's also a senior lecturer at AUT. AUT runs the school. Maria's tasked with running what's undoubtedly one of the most difficult curriculums in the country. Almost every one of our students speak either no English or very little English, and they also speak probably one of 12 different languages in one classroom. So they can't even communicate easily with one another within the group and the medium for teaching needs to be English. So if we're teaching um, maths, for example, um, to the kids, we teach it in English to children who understand very little English. It's a full school day for everyone for all six weeks, 9am to 3pm. Maria tries to replicate the average Kiwi classroom, whatever that means, except the majority of time spent is on learning English. Then there's a bit of everything else, art, music, PE. Giving that structure to the day helps people to feel safe again. It's like returning to normal life and it's also knowing what's coming next. And that routine helps people to start to feel they're back in a normal, safe environment. It's just gone 3 p.m. We've been here for an hour now. School's over for the day. Next is afternoon tea. Today, it's an orange. At least half of the 164 are here to get one, old and young. And whoever says curiosity diminishes with age has never brought a camera into a refugee centre. The kids one by one demand to go looking through the viewfinder. One cheeky man in his 30s asks if he can film for a bit. Most people spend most of the day outside when it's good weather. 
When they're not outside, though, they're in a mix between flatting and backpacker-style accommodation. There are six blocks with four apartments in each. Inside each apartment is four bedrooms and a basic shared lounge and kitchen. Two couches and a TV in the lounge, a mini fridge and a kettle in the kitchen. The bedrooms are small, but big enough to not feel claustrophobic, and everyone has access to the outdoors. Upstairs apartments have balconies, downstairs there are ranch sliders onto grass. But it's the small things that make you realise a lot of thought has been put into all this. After their time here, when each refugee moves into society and their own home, they're given the same furniture they had in the centre, beds, couches, everything. Familiarity and then in continuation so they, they will be familiar. We have staff who work with families and help families in, in learning about how to use New Zealand appliances and how to, you know, cleaning agents and cleaning detergents and all these things. Yeah, how so, to turn the heater on. Yeah, or... exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. All that, that kind of stuff. So, yeah. The kitchens are basic because everyone eats together. 150 people can fit in the dining hall, nearly the whole centre. The food is provided by a private catering company. Breakfast every day is porridge, cereals, stewed fruit, yoghurt and toast and spreads. Lunch, dinner and dessert changes every day. Here's a sample day. Chilli beef and bean fried rice for lunch with buffet tabbouleh and tuna rice salad if you're still hungry after that. And for dinner, chicken noodle soup, chicken and lemon tagine with herb tabbouleh and steamed broccoli and a seasonal garden salad with orange. Then trifle to finish for dessert. And one night a week... We have a theme evening when we bring everybody and they, they get to work together with, with our uh, cooks and then they, they, they cook their national meals. A worker I spoke to who's spent time working with refugees overseas described the centre as boutique. And it might sound weird, but I feel she's right. She compared it to America, which took 85,000 refugees last year. How could they be given the same level of care the 164 people here are given? At the end of their six weeks, it all comes full circle. Back to the school hall-esque room. They're here, back here, and you have children singing, you know, in English and in Maori, and then people sing, bring their, some of them will sing their songs from where they come from, and they, they, they will share their stories, and they, they will reflect on, the, on the, 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 the six weeks that they've spent here together. And it's, it's quite, quite special day as well. Yeah. On December the 8th, this intake will quietly slip out into New Zealand and try to live a normal life. They'll go to Auckland, Waikato, Manawatu, Wellington, Nelson and Otago. Most qualify for social housing. Immigration will do their best to make sure everyone leaves to a job. They will do their best to learn English and our customs and culture. We should do our best to include. Be welcoming. You know, to be able to say welcome to people who weren't welcomed in the country they fled to. They were living there maybe for, you know, some people up to 20 years. And then to come to a new place, it's really important that we say welcome and we mean it. For Checkpoint, Zach Fleming. A man who says he was sexually abused by his teacher for five years has told a court he waited until both his parents were dead before coming forward because he didn't want them to feel guilty. He's giving evidence at the Monaco District Court where his former teacher is on trial for the historic sex abuse at one of the country's most prestigious schools. Our Auckland Court reporter Edward Gay has been inside the closed courtroom listening to the evidence. Hi Eddie, welcome back to Checkpoint. Uh, the man talked about having two lives. Yeah, that's right. Good evening, John. Yes, he spoke of longing for normality while at the same time hoping that everything was going to be OK and, uh, that, and, and worrying that someone would find out about what was going on. The man said he knew what was happening was wrong and he tried to break off this relationship several times. He said initially when, uh, when it first started, uh, he was getting tuition once a week, but that changed to seeing the teacher daily after the teacher began touching him sexually. He said the teacher would build up his confidence telling him that he was special and at the time he didn't have many friends. He said the sexual abuse would happen in the teacher's office and at the teacher's home and some of the abuse also happened in the attic space above the teacher's office and that required 
both the teacher and the student uh, to climb on top of a chair on the teacher's desk and pull themselves into the attic. Uh, he eventually told a girlfriend, did he? Is that right? Yeah, that's right. After he finished up at school, he began a relationship with a young woman in a church group and he told her what his teacher had done to him. The man uh, said that his then girlfriend wrote an anonymous letter to the school and he only found out about that letter when he got a call from the teacher's wife. She asked him if uh, the letter was true and he confirmed that there had been a relationship, but he said he kept the whole thing secret from his parents after speaking to a lawyer in order to protect his parents. Uh, he, he didn't want them feeling guilty about sending him to the school. He, he was only approached by the police uh, two years ago, and it was then that he told investigators what had happened to him. OK, tell me about the cross-examination. He, he uh, confirmed under cross-examination, did he, that he hadn't told anyone else at the time? Or hadn't told anyone That's at the time? Right. That, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and the teacher's lawyer, Annabelle Maxwell-Scott, uh, said, uh, you know, that uh, his silence, uh, he, he told her that his silence had played on his conscience, especially after hearing that two other boys had been abused. And the, the court heard how the teacher has been convicted for uh, sexually abusing two other boys at another school. And the man also agreed that people came and went from some of the areas that he says the sexual abuse happened, um, but he said that the teacher was never caught out. He said there had been a meeting with the headmaster, actually, where he was asked directly if there was an inappropriate relationship. The man said the questions from the headmaster were asked in front of his mother in the in the headmaster's office, and and because his mother was there, he strenuously denied uh, those allegations. Yeah, and he he continued to you know he he agreed with Miss Maxwell Scott that he continued to visit the home of the teacher. But he said it was this strange mixture of being in a horrible situation but, but wanting normality. Miss Maxwell Scott asked if he was ashamed and angry about being a homosexual and if he blamed the teacher for this. Uh, the man said that was definitely not the case. He also said it was hard to know how being forced to have sex with an adult for four and a half years had influenced his life. And he accused the school of turning a blind eye to the abuse. Close court, Eddie. Um, thank you for reporting from it. We really appreciate it. Edward Gay, who was sitting in the court for us in Auckland. It is three and a half minutes to six. The sun blazed down as keen mountain bikers saddled up at the Christchurch Adventure Park for the first time since the devastating Port Hills fires ten months ago. The network of trails and the chairlift at the $24 million attraction was closed just eight weeks after opening, after sustaining major fire damage. But it's back. Con and Young went along for the reopening today. It was good, yeah. Really happy with how it is, yeah. Yep. Not too hot over there in the trees, a bit of shade, so it's good, yeah. Yep. Nice and flowy. Aaron Blomley and his friend Finn Hawksby-Brown were the very first mountain bikers on the chairlift when it opened today, meaning they got to be the first to ride down the newly opened trails. It's been a long wait for Finn, who was amongst the legions of thrill-seekers forced to cool their heels when the park was closed by the fires just two months after opening. I was here nearly every day and I did like 160 laps or something when it was open in the first eight weeks, so I was pretty pissed off. Finn says it's been a tough ten months, with the city's mountain bikers forced to use other tracks. They've kind of been a bit overused, so a bit getting a bit destroyed from all the use and... I know, just like getting real dusty because it's so hot at the moment and it's just kind of like hard to ride in those conditions. Talking to me just before the park opened this morning, the park's general manager, Ann Newman, said it was crucial to be back in business in time for summer. People are chomping at the bit to get back in here. We've already got riders, um, you know, we have not even open and they're sitting up in the cafe and waiting by the lift to, to get up there. It's really important for us to get back open for Christmas, you know, it's the height of the season, people are on holiday um, and it's a, a great place to be in the summer. Ann Newman says just three trails catering to beginner, intermediate and advanced riders are open from today, along with the cafe, the chairlift and four zip lines. Work is continuing on building further trails and by the end of March the park will have more than it had when it first opened in 2016. She says it's been a busy 10 months getting to this stage. Two thirds of the forest has had to come out, um, so the logging um, and all those trees have had to come out. All our trails have been destroyed, we've had to replace the chairlift um, and we've had to replace all four zip lines um, and now we're in the process of rebuilding um, all those trails, um, so it's been a big long 10 months. 
and while there are now fewer trees to provide shade for riders, on the plus side, Ann Newman reckons the view back over the Canterbury Plains to the Southern Alps has improved dramatically. In Ōtōtahi for Checkpoint, core Colin Young Tene. Thanks Colin, lots of feedback coming in, let's have some of it. Hi John, Re Napier Water, I live just north of Napier, have been here for over 50 years and guess what, the weather is normal year on year and the population has not, not gone up that much. More a question of who dropped the ball, seems more like the council took its eye off its monitors. Don't blame the residents, another case of the Napier Council not doing its job, resilience there is none. All the best. Cheers, Steve in Estale. It's a nice part of the world, Steve. John, the sudden and significant drop in water in Napier on Sunday may be linked to the two cruise ships being in town that day. Did they suck us dry? Asked Leanne. I don't know, no, Leanne, that's a good question. Uh, lots of feedback on the story about Otara. Thank you, people saying it made them cry and gave them goosebumps. And thanks for the refugee story. This was a beautiful antidote to the Trumpism and grief that otherwise dominates our news cycle. Thank you very much, says Alex from New Plymouth. RNZ News at 6. Good evening, I'm Anna Thomas. Napier's Mayor says the speed at which the city's reservoirs refilled proves the council's response to a potential water shortage was adequate. Reservoir levels dropped to a critical yesterday after usage soared during Sunday's hot weather. Many residents say they were only told to conserve water at the 11th hour and are furious at what they perceive to be a delayed response. But Mayor Bill Dalton says people were told in plenty of time and responded well. The proof of the pudding is in the eating and if you saw the response and how the reservoirs actually built up last night, it proves that the message did get out there and it worked and it proved people of Napier knew exactly what to do and they reacted positively. Bill Dalton says Napier residents use well above the national average of water and he won't rule out introducing water metres. The Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull has unveiled legislation aimed at tackling foreign espionage and interference. The government wants to create a new offence, making it illegal to covertly interfere with Australian politics on behalf of another country. It also wants to create a new register for foreign lobbyists and ban political donations from overseas. Mr Turnbull says stronger laws are needed to protect Australia's democracy. We must ensure that our politics, our parliament, is strong enough to withstand attempts by foreign powers to interfere or influence it. Foreign powers are making unprecedented and increasingly sophisticated attempts to influence the political process. Malcolm Turnbull. Both major Australian parties have been under scrutiny regarding their links to wealthy Chinese business people. The US Supreme Court has ruled that the latest version of President Trump's travel ban can be implemented in full, pending continuing legal challenges in lower courts. The ban restricts travel to the US by people from six mainly Muslim countries – Iran, Libya, Syria, Yemen, Somalia and Chad. A spokesperson for the American Civil Liberties Union, Cecilia Wang, says opponents of the ban are determined to keep fighting. It's a basic constitutional freedom that we have as an American that the president of the United States uh, or any other government agency for that matter cannot disparage or disfavor one religion among others. We're certainly not backing down from the fight and we'll uh, take that fight wherever it leads us. Cecilia Wang of the American Civil Liberties Union. The Greens leader, James Shaw, won't say whether he would support any sanctions applied to a scheme to get young people into work, as proposed by the New Zealand First Minister, Shane Jones. Mr Jones wants to get young unemployed people into what he calls a work for the doll scheme. The Prime Minister says any decisions would have to go through Cabinet, but anyone working would be paid at least the minimum wage. The Greens campaigned this year on removing some sanctions from the benefit system. Mr Shaw was asked whether he'd support sanctions under the scheme flagged by Mr Jones. Well, I have yet to see the proposal from Minister Jones. I'm, I'm quite looking forward to seeing it, simply because it is targeted in some of the most deprived areas of the country. And, you know, we've always said that those 90,000 young people who are not in education, employment or training, you know, need some additional support. Green Party leader James Shaw. A Waiheke Island church leader says long-term residents forced out of their rentals to make way for tourists are being left homeless because of a shortage of affordable housing. Over summer, tourists swell the island's population fourfold to 40,000. 
The Ministry of Social Development says demand for social housing on the island is low. But the Living Waters Church pastor, Wiramu at Te Tanifa, says around 50 people turn up to the church's weekly soup kitchen and its eight emergency accommodation cabins are full. A lot of them have been here most of their lives. A lot of the low families have been here for many, many years. But it's just getting so so hard for them to just survive. And I, I think that's the reason why not only do we do the accommodation, but we, we do the community soup kitchen because the cost of living is so high here. Some of the people tell us that by the time they pay their board in that, in particular the elderly in that, they've only got $40 left to survive on. Wedemu Tetanifa of the Living Waters Church. A boy on a scooter was struck by a ute and seriously injured in Hamilton this afternoon. The 11-year-old was taken to Waikato Hospital after the collision in the suburb of Dinsdale just after half past three. Police are asking anyone who saw what happened to contact them. All three firefighters injured while fighting a factory fire in Ashburton last night have now been discharged from the town's hospital. The Seals Winslow factory, which makes feed for livestock, was destroyed in the blaze. Fire and Emergencies Assistant Area Commander Mike John says two crews will remain at the site tonight to put out hot spots uncovered by a digger working through the rubble. He says two investigators are looking at what caused the blaze. It's five past six. The New Zealand pole vaulter Eliza McCartney says her rehabilitation from an Achilles injury is going as well as could be expected. McCartney won bronze at the 2016 Rio Olympics but had to settle for ninth at the World Championships this August as she battled with the problem. Announced today as one of the headline acts for Athletics New Zealand's International Series next March, McCartney says all signs are positive. She'll soon be back to 100%. Every day it's building up closer, as we're getting closer to the seasons every day it's getting a little bit more and we're able to add in more um, as my rehab programme continues and we're looking to be competing in um, February onwards so I think um, so far yeah it's looking good. Eliza McCartney. Australia is struggling in their second innings on day four of the second Ashes Test against England in Adelaide. A short time ago, the home side were 116 for seven, with seam bowler Jimmy Anderson inflicting further damage to have four wickets for the innings. Despite that, Australia still have an overall lead of 331. And the New Zealand cricket coach Mike Hessen says while he's not sure when BJ Watling will be ready to wicket keep again, he would have been picked for the second test against the West Indies had it he been passed fit to play. Watling is struggling with a hip injury and Tom Blundell uh, has been retained for the Hamilton game. And pace bowler Tim Southey is back in the side as well. And that's the news. Tonight on Nights, Matt Lowry from the website Transport Blog on whether we've reached peak motorway and whether it's time to replace the previous government's RONs with railways of national significance. Same destination, just different spelling. We have a window on the wood of the Norwegian delicacy Stockfish and Anne Kerwin celebrates the ethical thinking of the enlightened Scot Francis Hutchison. So join me, Brian Crump, after the news at 7 on RNZ National. And sorry, sorry, Anna <laughs> Thomas. It was my faultlessness. <laughs> OK, moving on to the weather right now. The northern Auckland and Coromandel Peninsula, mainly fine. Isolated showers about the coast north of Whangarei tomorrow. Waikato to Kapiti, including Bay of Plenty, Taupo, Taumaranui and Taihape, fine apart from isolated showers inland from Whanganui and Taihape northwards. Gisborne and Hawksburn mostly fine. However, cloud increasing later tomorrow with isolated light evening showers. Wellington and Wired Up are fine, but becoming cloudy overnight, then clearing towards midday tomorrow. Nelson Buller and Marlborough are fine, apart from isolated showers inland and areas of cloud about the Kaikoura coast. For the rest of the South Island, fine, but cloudy periods developing, and there could be some inland showers as well. And for the Chatham Islands, cloudy with a few showers tomorrow morning. RNZ National, it's eight minutes past six, and you're listening to Checkpoint with John Campbell. Thank you very much indeed. Anna Thomas. Auckland Council has disappointed environmentalists, and not only environmentalists, by deciding to keep the Waitakere Ranges open, despite the threat posed by Cody dieback disease. Councils this afternoon endorsed closing 13 tracks deemed to be at risk, but against... They voted against fully banning access to the city's second largest regional park. It's a decision many say is hugely disappointing. Laura Tupo was at today's meeting and filed this report. A resolution to close the Waitakere Ranges was lost by four votes. The Regional Manager of Forest and Bird, Nick Beveridge, says he's disappointed at the Council's inaction. I think it just seems a little bit too daunting 
and um, they, I guess they, they thought if we agree to this, then you know how, how are we going how are we going to roll it out? And I, I think they just found it too too much to, to cope with, and they went with more of a compromise. Forest and Bird says councils need more support from central government to fight the disease. The Auckland mayor Phil Goff told the meeting that while he sympathised with calls for total closure, policing such a ban would be near impossible. There is no way that we can simply close the park and ensure that nobody goes into it. Uh, unless you were to put an electric fence or a, or a razor wire fence around the park, which is absolutely impossible, uh, you won't be able to stop people who want to go into the park doing so. Councillor Ross Klo, who is the only councillor to live in the ranges, agreed and said the rahui that was put in place by local iwi on Sunday was the best option. I respect the rahui that's been put in place by, in place by Takara Amaki and uh, I will say it works. I've observed that uh, kare kare, the, the rahui there has actually led to a regeneration of the shellfish and by and large most people seem to respect it. Penny Hulse said even though the rahui doesn't have any legal teeth, the council will support it. We're going to encourage people to stay out of the ranges. Think about walking on a beach or somewhere else. Stay away from Kauri. Councillor Cathy Casey, who voted for total closure, said the council had an obligation to respect Māori wishes to close the park. And what amazes me is when we listen to Māori at this table and when we don't, and I'm urging you today to listen. They, they came here in good faith. They made a very strong case, supported by the Independent Maori Statutory Board, and it's supported by our obligations under the Treaty of Waitangi. Councillor John Watson also made an impassioned plea to close the park. It is a crisis. It's not something that can perhaps be managed uh, piecemeal. Um, or, or, or I thought we, we've sort of been down that route. Um, everyone acknowledges the work the council's done. But to a large extent, we've already tried this. There are 172 tracks in the Waitakere's. More face closure, but those details won't be known until February. However, all councillors, including the Mayor, agree more money needs to be invested in fighting the disease. Mō te hōtaka o te ahiahi, ko Laura Tupoa ho. Well, as we heard earlier on the programme, Napier residents are annoyed that their council didn't give them enough warning that the water supply was drying up. Lots of people suggesting it was those cruise ships. We will make inquiries about how much water they took on Sunday, but it's not the only region, Hawke's Bay, in the country suffering from the big dry. Clutha District Mayor Brian Cadogan is calling on residents to conserve water as reservoirs there steadily empty. Mayor Cadogan, are you on the phone? Good evening, John. Nice to talk to you. We haven't spoken for ages. There's a couple of things we I want to catch up. Yeah, I always enjoy <laughs> our conversations. But let's start with the important stuff. How is your uh, water storage situation? What have you got? Uh, it's a wee bit of a different dynamic we're having at the moment because we have had a dry period early on. You know, yeah. we're, we're, not, we're not geared up for droughts like Central Otago, so to, to get a dry patch at this time of the year, it's different. Yeah, um, and, 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 and worryingly, if you, if you get your dry in, in, in sort of February, March, when it often is, you're in real trouble, aren't you? No, it's actually worse now because in, in February and March you're starting to get a few lambs off to the works. The old ewes are gone, whereas now we're fully stocked. So the demand ah, is right. on. And consequently, seeing as a lot of our, our water schemes are both urban and rural, this high demand from the rural, plus, you know, the, we're asking all, all residents to start prioritising their water use. You know, don't, don't hose the garden. We've got better things to do with it at the moment. Okay, so is that a? Can you be explicit around that? Is that a ban? Are you a, a ban on, uh, on 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 everything except essential water use? Well, what we're saying at the moment is that in some of our schemes, some of the ones that we have, we have to give more priority to, please only water your garden once a week. Do it with a handheld hose, and do it from the hours of eight at night to eight in the morning. So they're pretty restrictive. It's as, as far as we go. But you've also got to consider, John, that, that our water reservoirs are there for firefighting, they're there for stock use, so we've got to prioritise it. Yeah, how are you farmers looking? What, what are, are there restrictions around uh, irrigation? We're not big on irrigation down here. There's a wee bit starting to come through, but I suppose we're dealing with nature, and um, it's funny that it's come on so early on in the year, but hope touch wood, it's going to rain soon. 
Yeah, the forecast isn't great on that front, but yeah, touch wood. What are your reasons why that? Don't tell Trumpy, but don't tell Trumpy, but there might be a thing called global warming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that's yeah, beyond. I don't know. think anyone's going to disagree with you there. What What are your reasons why that? What What are your big ones at? Right, uh, the, the two that are uh, closest, Tapanui's at fifty percent at the moment, and Lawrence is at seventy percent. So when you consider that a, a decent fire would take between 30 and 40% okay, of the okay. reservoir in one hut, we're getting pretty close to the pumps all right. So one final question on this subject, and that is your fire bans. Are total fire bans across your region? Yes. OK, good, thank you. Hey, do you remember when we were speaking, was it last year about Kaitangata and the whole world thought you were <laughs> offering people 160000 What was it, $160,000 no. to move? What, what, what was it? Just over 300000 for the house land package, so it was our get a job, get a house, get a life. Yeah, that's and right, that's, that's right. So yeah, so many people were calling you. Your cell phone exploded, didn't it? Hundreds of thousands of people made contact in one way or another with, with different ones around the district, but the jobs are still here, John. Have, the has, has, anyone, has, has anyone come? Oh, absolutely, yes. Oh, bloody uh, good. And, Who and came? The where have they come from? Where has where is where, where is the, 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 the furthest to feel person come from? Uh, North Island. <laughs> we've got any over We got inquiries from right around the world, but at the end of the day, it, it, it's New Zealanders that are coming, and those jobs are still there, John. Are they? The jobs we're, we're still you know, Finnegan, our local freezing works, is still going out right now, looking for over two hundred people. Two hundred people. Yeah, get a job, get a house, get a life. And what's a bit of land cost there? What are you, what are you selling a section for? Uh, we've got a brand new subdivision on the go where you'll get a beautiful quarter acre section looking out over the town of Belcoita for under 100,000. Katangata were really smart in putting together their house land package. They did deals left, right and centre. So, that, you know, talking with the surveyors and the builders and the everything. And they put together a really smart package that, that um, uh, you know, it's still there. It's still on the go. And jobs, guaranteed work when you arrive. Thing. Yeah. The big thing is, John, though, is that Kaitanka has seen that they are a place now for young families to have a decent start in life. Yeah. Gives you a chance to get back to those family values, and it's something so positive for the town. Brian Cadogan, always good to talk to you, the Mayor of the Clutha District. Thanks so much for joining us, Brian. Uh, not too far away, as the crow flies anyway, there's growing excitement in Dunedin about plans to reopen this hillside train workshops to build luxury rail carriages. A couple of people contacted me and said, I've got a fact wrong there, but I'm not sure what the fact wrong is. Whatever it is, I apologise. Uh, rail workshops, rail workshops. Thank you, everyone. That's the thing about being an RNZ, you all know. A private venture called Antipodean Explorer yesterday unveiled the scheme for the weekly train service to run from Auckland to Dunedin. We had a story about this last night. The company says it plans to refurbish 31 carriages at Hillside, which was mothballed by the national-led government five years ago. But could it really happen? Looking at this for us is our Otago Southland reporter, Ian Telfer. Five years after Hillside closed, there are four lease signs on some of the old train workshop buildings. But maybe they'll be coming down now. On the streets in South Dunedin, people love the idea of the former heart of the suburb reopening. Brings in jobs, too, right? But the yeah, open up, it's doing nothing at the moment, isn't it? It's doing a little bit of work, it needs to do a lot more. Too right, open it up. Yay! Yeah, great for the people. Great for the one G, so I think it's great. Yeah, no coal. That'd be something, wouldn't it? Though some people wonder if it's still possible. Those tradesmen are gone. They've found work otherwere. Can't see where they're going to find the staff. The Rail and Maritime Transport Unions welcomed the plan, saying it could mean jobs for 50 to 80 train builders. The Labour MP for Dunedin South, now a government minister, Claire Curran, has her office just a few hundred metres from Hillside and fought its closure. She says the luxury train idea is exciting and could be just the ticket the workshops need. This is very hopeful. I'm feeling very um, positive about it. The reopening of Hillside is on my agenda as the local MP. Um, I will be helping to drive this through. The national-led government shut Hillside in 2012 after the state-owned enterprise Kiwi Rail opted to buy wagons from China to save money. The National List MP in Dunedin, Michael Woodhouse, says he supports anything that brings work to the city, but it's now up to Labor to show the idea is viable. Labor are now in government and they have to either put up or shut up. A and this will be the, the very first test of Clear Current's commitment to Hillside uh, since, since its closure.
The chief executive of the Otago Chamber of Commerce, Dougal McGowan, is in China this week and he heard about the plan from New Zealand's Consulate General in Shanghai yesterday. He says the new government's pushing rail and that's a big opportunity for Dunedin. They've talked quite strongly about uh, light rail as an option um, for throughout the whole country. Uh, particularly in that upper North Island, it's got to be made somewhere. We have the infrastructure to be able to do that, hopefully. Um, uh, and, and we've got to make sure that if it does come to fruition, that we're in the right place to be able to say, yep, Dunedin's ready, we want to be at the forefront of this. Dougal McGowan says he's already called a meeting for next Friday to work up a bid to make Dunedin the centre for building Auckland's light rail. And the luxury train will go straight onto the top of the agenda. I o te pōti, mō te hōtaka o te ahi ahi, Ko Ian Telfer, aho. Thanks, Ian. Let's go to the US now, where a huge environmental fight is shaping up over what perhaps are the United States' most iconic landscapes. Bears Ears National Monument is 1.35 million acres. Reach and restore. I've come to Utah to take a very historic action to reverse federal overreach and restore the rights of this land to your citizens. That was Donald Trump. Um, basically, he was announcing that he's slashing f federally protected land in the state of Utah by more than 800,000 hectares. The move which affects Bears Ears National Monument and the area known as the Grand Staircase Escalante is a reversal of protections put in place by the Obama administration. Environmentalists and native tribes are already taking legal action, while Mr Trump's supporters say the decision is a proper response to decades of federal interference. Controversial? You betcha. CNN's Bill Weir has more from Southern Utah. Bears Ears National Monument is 1.35 million acres. That is over 2,000 square miles of wild western vistas, holding a potential fortune in oil, gas, and uranium underneath tens of thousands of Native American ruins. <laughs> to folks like Mark Maryboy, these sites are worth more than any mineral. To the Navajo and Hopi, Zuni and Utes, these canyons hold the spirits of loved ones. They live among us just like you and I were communicating. These are your neighbors living. Yes. But equally striking are the modern bullet holes, just one sign of the tension that goes back to the first Mormon wagon trains. They didn't want to work with us. In fact, one of the county commissioners says, you guys lost the war. You have no business talking about land planning process. For generations, natives sought protection for this land, but it wasn't until the five tribes put aside their differences rallied the support of rich outdoorsmen like Patagonia founder Yvon Chonard and lobbied the feds that they got their wish. Weeks before leaving office, Barack Obama declared Bears Ears off limits to any new drilling or mining. And while some cheered the prospect of a new tourist economy, others saw it as pure tyranny. It felt like a kind of a sucker punch. Okay. Um, it didn't feel right. And it hasn't felt right for a year. Phil Lyman is among the Trump supporters who spent the weekend cheering the president's decision to shrink Bears Ears by more than 80% and Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument by nearly half. They point out that the biggest, poorest county in Utah already has four other parks and monuments. They don't want elites using their backyard as a playground and just want to control their own destiny. By designating a monument, what you're doing is you're using a tool that will bring hordes of people to a place that is very sensitive. There is nothing that we want to unprotect. There's 13 layers of protection on artifacts and species and wildlife and, uh, and vegetation. There are loopholes in those rules that you can drive an oil rig through. Josh Ewing came from Nebraska to climb rocks. Painted shirts, that's a rim of a bowl. And fell so hard for the landscapes and history, he formed an advocacy group and is building a visitor center with whatever donations he can raise online. If this place was anywhere else but southern Utah, I don't care if it was Mongolia or Zimbabwe, it would have been protected as a national park a long time ago. But because of the politics of Utah, this place is still a debate. Well, I think the only thing this administration understands is lawsuits and the head of Patagonia says he's ready for a long legal fight. We're losing this planet and we have an evil government and 
you know, not just the federal government, but the, the wacko politicians out of Utah and places. I mean, it's evil. And I'm not going to stand back and just let evil win. And what's, what's his net worth? Billion dollars? Two billion dollars? So you've got Patagonia here, you know, waving the flag of environmentalism while he's just completely exploiting the outdoors for industrialized tourism. If these rocks could talk, they'd tell of centuries of bloody human conflict before the United States decided to set aside the special corners for we the people. Bill Weir saying if these rocks could talk with a voice that did sound rather magnificently gravelly. Reporting there from southern Utah. Let's go to some, poor, some sport. World champion shot putter Tom Walsh and pole vault star Eliza McCartney have been confirmed as the headline acts for the Athletics New Zealand International Series in March, just two weeks before the Commonwealth Games. The series will feature events in four different places, including Walsh's hometown, Timaru. Not long ago, he was still a builder there. Christchurch, Auckland, and the iconic, cook, uh, the iconic Cook's Garden in Whanganui, of course. Sports reporter and Clay Wilson caught up with Walsh and McCartney at the announcement in Auckland today. In his truly Kiwi style, Tom Walsh describes 2017 as one hell of a year. Probably fair enough when you consider, among other achievements, he did add a world championship crown to his increasingly impressive shot put CV. The 25-year-old got five weeks off at the end of his busy season, giving him the chance to throw his builder's apron back on and do a few days' work on his own almost completed house. But breaks for elite athletes are really too long. And ahead of a 2018 that includes a World Indoor Champs and Commonwealth Games, Walsh is already ripping back into training. At 6 foot 1 and around 120 kilograms, he somehow managed to add a backflip to his bag of tricks and says he won't be slowing down over the holiday period. A lot of people in the working world have time off over Christmas and New Year's. I, don't, I can't afford to do that very important time of year for me, you know, because I've got a comp in late Jan to get ready for and, uh, you know, it's, it's, I've just got to work right through it. The same is true for pole vaulter Eliza McCartney. 20-year-old McCartney thrilled the nation with her shock bronze medal at last year's Rio Olympics. But the end of her 2017 season was not so memorable, as she struggled with an Achilles injury that left her to settle for ninth at August's World Champs. McCartney's National Secondary School's record of 4 metres 10 was also broken at the weekend by teenager Olivia McTaggart who shattered the previous mark by 20 centimetres. Despite that, McCartney says her rehab is tracking well, and she says this year's negatives will become positives in the long run. You've got to have those hard times to know what it is to have a good time, and, and you've got to be able to get through those hard times so that you know how to, how to deal with them and how when they come up again, because they probably will, yeah. <laughs> let's face it, they'll come up again. So um, I think it's really valuable to have, been, have gone through it, and luckily it wasn't such a major year this year, so it didn't matter so much that I had to find my feet a little bit through injury. Walsh also battled injury issues in 2017, but says he's now back in tip-top shape. It bodes well for a big performance at the World Indoors, where he is defending champ, and the Commonwealth Games, where he is determined to go one better than his silver medal effort in 2014. Walsh says the New Zealand series will be ideal preparation for the Gold Coast, and he can't wait to host one of the events in his hometown. I'm sure that there'll be a few messages and a few phone calls to Sean, mate, about, uh, hey, hook a brother up, you know, and uh, get, me in the, get me into the hospitality kind of table and things like that. But uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm really excited to take a community event back to Timaru and, and involve the kids, involve the public in, in what I do. McCartney will also play host to an event, with the Vertical Pursuit Pole Vault competition on the move after its first edition early this year. The event will fittingly be held directly in the shadows of the Sky Tower, and Athletics New Zealand are hoping for a crowd of a thousand plus to create what should be a superb setting for some of the sport's best. McCartney has yet to set herself a specific target for the event, but says fans can expect all the athletes to be putting up some impressive numbers. Because it's so close to the Commonwealth Games, it's going to be my second to last competition before I head into the pre-camp before I go away. So it's, it's going to be a big one. It's going to, you know, you're going to want it to be going well and be ready because it's, it's, it's your last kind of test of how you're going to be going. So I think it's going to be really exciting to do it in such a cool atmosphere. We'll just make it even better. The series starts with the Timaru Super Shot on March 14 and wraps up with the Sir Graham Douglas International in West Auckland 11 days later. For Checkpoint, Clay Wilson. Just before we go tonight, uh, terrifying news really for people who think their children are already spending too much time on their devices. Facebook has introduced a messenger chat app for kids. The app designed for children aged under 12 has been launched in response to competition from Snapchat. Jane Lanhee-Lee from Reuters explains. 
Facebook rolled out a Messenger Kid app for children under 13 on Monday. The app allows the social media giant, which already has over 2 billion users, to expand into an untapped market. Facebook normally requires users to be at least 13 years old. The standalone app on children's devices can be controlled by a parent's Facebook account, and kids can use video chat, send photos, videos, or text messages to friends approved by their parents. The new app could help Facebook hook kids earlier at a time when it faces competition from other social media platforms like Snapchat. Social media for kids under 13 isn't new. There are already a handful of apps that children can use with parental consent, and kids can text others on cell phones. And fudging one's age gives kids access to most apps today. Facebook said research showed young children were already using technology on a regular basis, but on apps built for teens and adults, raising concern for parents, their children might be communicating with strangers. The new Messenger Kids is so far only available in the U.S. on Apple products. I've got nothing to say to that as a father of children who look at screens a lot, particularly my son. But boy, there's a lot of it, isn't there? Uh, 30 seconds to go. There's a lot of feedback tonight. A lot of very uh, upset, disappointed, even angry people about uh, the council's decision in Auckland not to basically close down the Waitakere Ranges. Uh, this, Māori a kaitiaki of our forests, etc. For goodness sake, respect the guardianship and let them get on with the Rahui and support them. Not a single person has contacted us tonight supporting the council's decision. Thank you for your feedback. Thank you for being with us. We will be back tomorrow night at 5. RNZ News headlines at 6.30. Napier's mayor is defending the council's response to the city's water shortage, saying the drop in use proves residents got the message quickly and effectively. Waitakere councillor Penny Hulse says while she would have loved the entire regional park to be closed to fight kauri dieback disease, legally it's just too hard. A Porirua school principal believes the government's zero free policy will encourage, rather zero fee policy, will encourage more young people in the tertiary study. And the chief ombudsman has released a scathing report into Christchurch Men's Prison after an unannounced inspection. The Department of Conservation has asked the police to investigate a threatening letter over the use of 1080 and the Christchurch Adventure Park, forced to close by the Port Hills fires in February, has reopened. Our next news and